Hi everyone. On today's episode of Writing Notes, I'm going to take you guys through another logical system um, or another argumentation structure. Uh, this time one called the Aristotelian Syllogism. Um, now, syllogism is basically a three-part logical structure working from premises to reach a conclusion. This is a deductive system. Um, we call it an Aristotelian syllogism, even though a lot of other uh, logicians and rhetoricians and stuff like this have developed their own theories of the syllogism. Um, but Aristotle gives us the basic framework. Aristotle, of course, um, the ancient Greek philosopher. So uh, essentially what makes a syllogism a syllogism is that it works from premises to a conclusion. Specifically, it works from a major premise through a minor premise to a conclusion. So this is what it looks like. So a major premise is a broad statement of condition. Um, so all things within this group have this characteristic. The minor premise takes a specific example and identifies it as within that group. And therefore we can conclude that this specific example has whatever condition it is. We have a very uh, very famous classical syllogism, which may make this a little bit more concrete for us. All men are mortal, Aristotle is a man, therefore Aristotle is mortal. So the premise here, the major premise here, is that all men are mortal. This is a broad conditional statement um, theological issues aside, which we can accept to be true. Then we have a specific example. Aristotle is a man. So this is one particular example that fits within the broad group whose characteristics are being identified. Therefore, because Aristotle fits into this group, he must be mortal. So we have our conclusion that Aristotle is mortal. We don't actually need to see Aristotle die in order to conclude that Aristotle must be mortal because we've used this logical structure. Now, one of the keys here, um, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier, is that in order for uh, in order for the syllogism to work logically, both the major premise and the minor premise have to be accepted as true. So. Um, all men are mortal is something that we would need to accept as true in order to logically get to the conclusion. If we had, for instance, some men who weren't mortal, then uh, the premise would no longer be reliable, which would mean the conclusion would no longer be reliable. So this is something very important, um, and actually one of the big problems with um, when, for instance, politicians and people like this make syllogistic arguments um, is often the premises they work from are unreliable, and so their conclusions may be unreliable as well. Um, now, that being said, one of the ways that we tend to think about uh, syllogisms is algebraically with sets of letters. So the basic syllogisms, algebraic formula, would be all A is B, X is A, therefore X is B. So again, all things within the category A are B, X is within the category A, therefore X is B. Now, not uh, syllogisms are not always this simple, they're not always this absolute, and they're not always positive. Um, we in fact have two different uh, well, okay, so there's a ton of different types of syllogisms. People have come up with a bunch of them. But there's four major ones um, that break down along two different axes. One is absolute syllogisms versus conditional syllogisms. And the other is positive syllogisms versus negative syllogisms. So, um, as with all logical propositions, the distinction between an absolute and conditional is that with an absolute, all examples of the thing must conform to a specific rule. Um, with conditional, some, some examples of a thing must conform to that rule. Um, so, uh, we can say all students learn. 
is an absolute. If there is even one student who does not learn, then that statement is untrue. On the other hand, if we said some or most students learn, then we could have students who don't learn, and that statement would still be true. So this is the distinction between absolutes and conditionals. Um, on the other hand, with syllogisms, we have a distinction between positive and negative, um, and that's things are or things are not. This is fairly straightforward. So we can chart these four main types of syllogisms along this axis, or along this sort of graph thing. Now, I don't remember high school math very well, so I think this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis, but I may be wrong, so forgive me if I am. Um, so we have a category here of absolute syllogisms. All A are B, X is A, therefore X is B. Um, so that would be a positive absolute. So in this statement, we're establishing a positive condition. This is this through absolutes. All of the examples of A are B. Uh, we also have a negative absolute. No A are B, X is A, therefore X is not B. So we're establishing a non-condition. X cannot be B because no A are B. And this again is an absolute. If there's even one A that is B, this statement and this syllogism are unreliable. Over here we have conditional syllogisms. Um, so these would be... Uh, these would be ones that allow for exceptions to the rule. So some A are B. This would be our positive major premise. Um, so this allows that some A are not B. But the premise here, some A are B, X is A, allows us to conclude that X may be B. So X may in fact be whatever category, whatever condition it is that's described by B. Uh, comparably with our conditional negative, some A are not B, X is A, therefore X may not be B. So X may be B, but it may not be B, and the conclusion that we're drawing is that it may not be B. I realize this is somewhat confusing. Um, so this is a basic logical structure, and what you, what you would do is take this approach to argument, take this approach to thinking and conclusions, and fill in your own positive content. So um, if, we're, if we're thinking of this in terms of a real-world example, um, one syllogistic argument that we might make is in every school that has cut funding to arts and music, overall test scores have declined. So this is our major premise. In every case where uh, funding for arts and music has been cut, this has been the result, that test scores have dropped. Uh, Craig Hill Elementary, no actual reflection on Craig Hill Elementary. Uh, Craig Hill Elementary is cutting funds to art and music. This would be our minor premise. So we take the specific example of one actual school and say this is, uh, this is the condition of that specific example. Therefore, we can conclude that grades, um, uh, that test scores will drop. And this is a future uh, sort of imagining. Uh, this is a syllogism that imagines the future. That's a better way to put it. So we say, here is a trend, uh, here's the set of evidence that we have, here's the specific case, here's what we can conclude will happen. Because, uh, because all cases, all schools that have cut funding for arts and music have seen lower test scores, and Craig Hill Elementary wants to cut funding for arts and music, therefore we can conclude that Craig Hill will see lower test scores. This is, a, uh, this is a syllogism. Uh, this is, again, an absolute positive syllogism. In all cases, this has happened. Uh, this is the specific case. Therefore, this is going to happen. So this would be your uh, all A, R, B uh, syllogism. Um, so this is a very sort of basic argument. And in fact, uh, one of the things that we often find in sort of real-world rhetoric, real-world logic, politics, and things like this is that we get 
the conclusion of a syllogism and the audience or the, the reader or the listener or what have you uh, is left to supply the, the premises. So um, if we went straight for uh, cutting funding to, uh, if Craig Hill cuts funding to arts and education, or to arts and music, then test scores will drop. This is a logical statement. What the, uh, what the listener or reader would need to do at that stage is fill in the major and minor premises, which I've already given you for the purpose of this video. Um, but you're more likely to encounter a statement like that, that if Craig Hill Elementary cuts funding to arts and music, then we will see lower test scores. This is the kind of statement you're likely to run into, and it's based on syllogistic thinking, even though the person making the statement doesn't supply your major premise and your minor premise. They give you the conclusion, but it's based on that syllogism. So what you want to think about as an author, what you want to think about as a critical reader, is how you get to the conclusions that you're trying to reach or how does an author get to the conclusions that they're trying to reach? And is that structure, is the way that that information is presented reliable, convincing, uh, and logically correct? Thank you.